just be patient both my lovely meeting attendees and the internet as we make sure this is working. Let's see. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, all right. Our public link is live. We are live. Uh, Peter, when you are ready, take it away. Yeah, Dewey, um, if you could just put the current link on the website. I tried the link that's on the website and it says video unavailable. Um, that would be great. Um, but yeah, otherwise, um, Good welcome point. everyone. Cool Thanks, Dewey. <clears throat> um, otherwise, welcome everyone here. Welcome uh, Luke Damrosh, who is our speaker today. Um, before I turn it over to Luke, um, just a quick plug. Uh, although our crowdfund has ended, uh, I guess, two days ago now, um, we are still accepting donations to support our guest artists and our participants at Z Festival. Um, you should be able to find a link uh, below in the YouTube chat. Um, and please, uh, we appreciate all the support that you can send. Uh, but without further ado, uh, Luke, welcome and uh, take it away. Thanks for, for having me and, and thanks again to Shoshana and Peter for some really good advice when I was working on kind of a, a draft of this. It was really helpful. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start off with just like a little kind of mini slideshow thing, but then instead of doing too much, just throwing information at people, I want to definitely keep it pretty conversational and, and just cover a bunch of stuff that I think will probably be on most people's minds and hopefully some things that will be helpful, um, especially with Z Festival. So I'm just going to share this to get started. Everyone see that? Great. So uh, this is me and this is also me. And uh, I am a, for those of you who haven't met already, um, I am a recording engineer and I do mostly acoustic music recording, a lot of new music and a lot of classical stuff, kind of a mix. And I live in Boston, uh, I work at Harvard and I do freelance stuff all over the area. And uh, today I thought it would be good to talk about um, instrumental sound radiation patterns, kind of needlessly technical way of calling that what it is, but it's obviously really important uh, for home recording. Uh, room acoustic stuff, uh, also extremely important, some microphone considerations, and then also um, technical, bunch of technical stuff. I, I'm open to talking about whatever is on people's minds, but just, I want, definitely wanna address that because I'm sure everyone is dealing with it in their own, their own way to make these recordings happen and all that sort of thing. And then to break things up, I wanna do like a little Q and A sort of at the end of each little subsection and keep it kind of moving and not too, um, lecture like, and then if there's a little time at the end, uh, I may go into some detail on some pretty nerdy stuff that I've been doing lately, but which maybe is interesting to some people. Uh, and before I go further, I also wanted to quickly make this point um, that Peter, I think, will remember uh, that. So if you imagine this kind of um, basic categorization of, of people with sound engineers and opinionated people, it's unfortunately definitely the case that most sound engineers fall into this middle overlap region. And I'm certainly no exception to that, I'm sure. So uh, I'm definitely gonna try to explain that there's like different ways to do things. And what I'm presenting is not intended to be, you know, the only way or the right way to do anything. Um, but I like to think that I'm sort of on that side of, of the distribution at least and and so and if people you know feel like something i'm recommending doesn't make sense for them or they have a question about something that seems unorthodox but you know i i'm not going to be a snob about it or something you know we should just talk about things that are of interest to people so i'm gonna get out of here for a sec um and i think probably the the main thing to start with with um, sound radiation to talk about is the the fact that the mathematical kind of I ideal that you always like read about in textbooks and stuff in the acoustics is like you have this point source and then it, the sound is going to like radiate out like a sphere 
And in theory, that's how that works, of course. I mean, that's well established, but like in practice, that's never what's really happening because first of all, if the sound isn't coming from a point, it's coming from usually a much larger instrument, like especially, you know, piano or a bassoon or something pretty big. Um, and then on top of that, the way that it radiates out is very directional and frequency dependent. So it's not really helpful at all to imagine this kind of shell of sound coming out in a, in a sphere from the source. And um, that's really important to keep in mind. And, and this brings up a really important point for everyone doing home recording with mic placement, because if you put up a mic next to your instrument or, or if you're a vocalist, however, it's oriented relative to the sound source, you may find that, you know, wow, this really doesn't sound right. And it could be that, you know, there's some issues with maybe the room acoustics or there's, there's a million reasons why it might not sound quite right. But something that a lot of people may not immediately think of is the issue of how the sound is, is radiating. And, you know, if, if you're playing a cello, for example, there's certain frequencies that only go at various angles out of the instrument and not at others. And if the microphone is in one of those spots, it may overemphasize a certain register or have a sort of dead spot where it's not picking up maybe the lower register the way you imagine. I have a few diagrams that I'll show of that in a second. And um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And definitely for home recording, the mic placement is probably one of the single easiest things you can do to change the sound that you're getting. And um, definitely don't be afraid to try maybe even putting some, some mic in a somewhat unexpected place. Uh, you can be surprised how, how it might sound. And um, once you have a placement that you like and, and you know that you're getting some good results from that, you know, definitely try to try to repeat that when you can um, and make it part of your, your setup. Because that's, that's one of those things where, yes, to a certain extent, if you make a recording and the frequency is a little like uneven in a certain way, like you can EQ, you can do different things as an engineer to try to smooth it out, but it's a million times better to get it right if possible in the recording, it'll sound much more natural and um, be much better. So that's that's a point I wanted to make. And then I'm gonna go back uh, quickly to the um, slides just to show these uh, radiation patterns are, are pretty cool. There's a bunch more. These are taken from a book um, that was originally in German. Um, it's called Acoustics and the Performance of Music. It's a very, very good textbook um, and they did this these studies so these are based on on research that was done using like a whole bunch of microphones i don't know how many they used a dozen or 25 or something and they would put them in like a hemisphere completely around the performer all at the same distance and then they would record the musician playing and measure different frequency bands and see how they radiate from the instrument so just looking at the oboe uh, this is a perfect example where um you know if you can see this little sort of fake laser pointer, um, you know, a thousand Hertz right here is, is pretty broad. Uh, but if you had a microphone above the player's head, which would not be that uncommon, maybe like an orchestral situation, you put a mic up here, you're not really gonna get too much at that particular frequency. Not that that would necessarily sound bad, but you know, it's, it's definitely gonna sound different than if it were here, for example. And then there's some even more kind of complex behavior like up here an octave higher like if you have the mic here you're in like completely in a sort of weird dead spot and um each instrument is different and obviously you have to remember this is going to be in three dimensions too so it's it's not like you need to sort of memorize anything or like get too nerdy about stuff like this but it's just good to remember like these basic kind of properties and one thing that is i think really important to keep in mind is like the basic behavior maybe of, of your instrument or your family of instruments. So like, for example, woodwind instruments, this is very typical that a lot more sound comes out of the, the body of the instrument sort of perpendicular than people sometimes think. And actually very little sound comes directly out of the bell, regardless of the specific instrument. That's kind of a common theme. Um, so just stuff like that, like basic principles, it, it's really good to keep in mind. And then that's cello, same idea. Uh, and again, there's a bunch of weird sort of unexpected things, like especially in the middle here, 250 hertz, like who would who would imagine that that almost entirely reflects backwards? You know, it's pretty bizarre. Um, and then not that much 
higher or lower, you know, it, it's coming the opposite direction. Um, flute, uh, similar to the, not, well, not entirely similar, but, you know, there's some parallels to the, the oboe. Um, and then again, bassoon, uh, just to compare. And that's, that's pretty interesting too. So you can find stuff like that online pretty easily. And um, it's, it's really cool just to, to keep in mind. So um, that's something I wanted to mention. Does anyone have any, any questions about, about that stuff before I go on to anything else? I'm happy to take a second. Um, I realize that might bring up some thoughts for people. I, I, I had a quick thought. Yeah. Um, so looking at the oboe pattern, you realize a lot of people do um, mic above it and I've done a couple of recordings for orchestras and it seems like session miking isn't flattering at all to any of the instruments. So how do the people reach that conclusion given how many different parameters there are to think about? Yeah, so like in that type of situation, it's extremely common that it's always gonna be a compromise and the absolute number one priority is to get a uh, isolated, relatively isolated pickup of the instruments because the whole point of having like the sectional microphones is so that you can change the balance later. So unfortunately, even if it's not an ideal position, um, usually if you have it maybe pointing somewhat down uh, and using a you know a directional microphone that's going to exclude stuff that's bleeding in from behind that'll give you a much more direct pickup of that section and then even though it's not maybe the most flattering you're probably not going to use it at a super high level in the finished mix and like there's all these compromises which is actually one thing that's kind of cool about doing home recordings is like yes maybe it's a little weird and maybe your room isn't the you know most glorious acoustic environment in the world but you have like absolute freedom how you want to put the mic to try to get the best result you can and like for most concert recording i mean maybe you get like the main mics which are usually hanging in the spot you want but the vast majority of other mics that you put anywhere else it's like how do i get a decent sound to have balance control without getting tons of bleed from whatever is nearby so it's it's rarely like you know an optimal situation unfortunately but the other thing to keep in mind too is like you know if you look closely at those diagrams and you can find even nerdier ones that have more sort of slices of frequencies i mean there's no one spot where you pick up everything from the instrument so it's not like like no matter where you put it there's something that's going to be and it's not like it's going to stick out like a sore thumb or something i mean the subjective impression is much more like oh it sounds kind of bright here it sounds kind of like muddier here like but maybe you want more like sort of weight or whatever i mean it's not like you know clearly 43 centimeters above and in this quadrant the lack of energy at 750 hertz is unacceptable i mean it's like there, you would never be like thinking in those I, I mean some people i'm sure but most people would probably never be awesome thanks yeah uh luke there's a question uh from oh. youtube um that is asking if they want to look up other instruments um where should they search for what should they search for and where can they find more information yeah so that that book is um is great but it's it's pricey and you may be able to find like pdfs of it or, or through a library uh network but um if you just google the phrase like instrumental sound radiation there's tons of, of research on this stuff and, and from lots of different sources and you can find really good um diagrams that are out there that's how i got those i mean they come from that book but someone just shared them online so it's pretty easy to find. Um, what's really cool that's harder to find is there are a few, I, I don't have access to any of them, but I've seen on like YouTube videos, people share stuff where um, people doing, you know, like PhD research at, at universities in, in acoustics and stuff will do these experiments where instead of just a diagram, they'll play recordings. Like they'll show you the photo, you know, here, this is where the violist sat. We had 15 microphones arranged like this. They show you the photo of all the microphones. And then they're like, now we're going to listen to this one. Now we're going to listen to this one. Now we're going to listen to that one. You know, that's really cool. Cause then you actually hear it, but those aren't as re readily available. So I don't have any, um, any advice for that. I'm afraid, but if you can find them, they're super cool. I've, I've heard them. Um, yeah, Laura, you wrote about, um, moving the mic, uh, that would definitely create problems. And even if you don't move the mic, most musicians move themselves to a certain extent, which is obviously not their 
fault or something to worry about per se. Uh, I mean, if that was really a problem, most recordings would sound bad and there are many great recordings that prove that that's not a problem at all, but it definitely changes things a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wonder if anyone, if anyone has any other questions about this, I can go over that, but I, I don't wanna go too, too deep into just this one thing, I think, cause it's pretty specific. So, but I just did, I wanted to make those points as part of the overall thing. Anyone else have any? No, okay. So for room acoustics, um, that's really another big thing. And that kind of is also a parallel consideration with the instrumental behavior. And um, obviously the room is really important and people sometimes forget like when you listen to a recording of, of acoustic music, not like a pop recording, but you know, classical or chambered stuff that's done in the normal way, you're not really hearing a recording of instruments per se. Like every, in, the sound of every instrument you're hearing in that recording is really the sound of that instrument plus the sound of that room. Uh, and that's good usually uh, if you have a, a good room. And I mean, the whole aesthetic of the recording, you know, is, using the room to, to help create a sound in a, in a good way. But, um, you know, if you're doing it at home and the room is not ideal, then it becomes more of a negative, you know, variable. And, and then it's really an issue where you don't want it to get into the recording too much. And the unfortunate thing is that um, all those, what you're basically hearing when you hear the sound of the room is, is even if you were not hearing reverb, like this room that I'm in, you know, if I clap my hands, there's no perceivable echo, but just the fact that these surfaces are close to me, there will be reflections that bounce off and come back. They return extremely quickly in a small room and those get into the recording and you don't hear them as, you know, echo as such, but typically what will happen is the instrument just will sound kind of small, maybe kind of, or kind of weirdly tinny, weirdly, you know, boxy or muddy, like there's all these different words that people use for that, but it's basically an issue that's being caused by the early reflections as they're called, sort of coloring the tonality of the recording and, and, and not keeping it as natural. And part of the reason why it sounds more natural in a really big room is not only like, oh, the beautiful acoustics of the cathedral or whatever, but um, just the fact that all the surfaces are so much further from the instrument, the, the direct sound from the, from the source hits the microphone much sooner than any reflections bouncing back. So that's automatically a more neutral kind of natural way to, to pick up the sound. So it's partly just like the volume. So for home stuff, um, definitely better to be in your room if you can, um, that avoids the most problematic stuff acoustically. And I, I have a separate little thing for the home recording advice I'm gonna give some recommendations on that. But um, I also wanted to just show this little animation that I found on YouTube, which is pretty, um, pretty cool. This is from a very, um, oh, that's the wrong screen. That's my notes as such. This one, you guys see that? So this is from uh, a very uh, pricey, fancy Danish, uh, room acoustics simulation software called Odeon. But basically what they're doing here is you can see this sort of wireframe model. So they've they've like mathematically simulated the, the concert hall. And then in this sub window here um, where this little red dot is, it, they run an animation that shows how sounds would diffuse in that space. And it, it's it's a short little clip. And if you just watch this, I think you'll get a sense. It's pretty crazy. Um, right here. It, it's choppy in the original because I think it takes a lot of horsepower and was hard for the person's, you know, computer to like stream it and record it at once. But you can see here the sound bouncing everywhere. And, you know, as it, as it um, changes color, you know, that's presumably the, the level or the number of bounces. Yeah, reflection order. Um, but I mean, it's a pretty crazy complex thing. You know, it's, it's hard to even like mathematically model how intense that process is 
and you know if we like pause this video right now so it's 185 milliseconds so it's less than a fifth of a second what we just watched that all of that is is happening and so it's pretty crazy um it's very very complex and and definitely important to keep in mind the room the room is super important um yeah the uh biggest thing i guess that i would say for to to have if you can is is um the either you know bookshelves or or shelves or furniture something that has some absorption and breaks up the surfaces what would be like the worst possible room would be like a small room with lots of parallel walls that are made of like a smooth reflective material uh as i'm sure you guys all know this anyway but so um and if you can't help but be in a room like that there's even still a lot of stuff you could do like for example um you know if you have a bed you could play facing the bed so that the direct sound from the instrument maybe gets absorbed by something large and soft. You know, it's probably, I, I can't make a generalization, but I would, could imagine it could be better to maybe be in a corner versus, uh, like not like tight in a corner, but you know, the orientation of the corners of the room can make a big impact. Um, yeah, I don't know what that hall is. It might be uh, any of those, or it might just be some generated one. Uh, and, and and it's almost never a good idea in a small room to be at a midpoint between any surface. Um, that's another good rule of thumb. Uh, like if you were going to set up a home studio monitoring setup, you, you want to avoid that. And the same goes for recording. So um, that's a good basic starting point. And any, anything absorption, you know, blankets, towels, anything like that can, can help. And you may not really need that, but if you find that, oh, it, it sounds kind of weird, you know, um, that can really, really help. And obviously the single biggest thing you can do that's very helpful is to get the microphone close to the instrument. And you definitely wanna be pretty close and it's gonna minimize how much of the room it picks up. You get more direct sound, but partly because of what we were just talking about with all the directionality stuff, uh, you know, maybe if you're a vocalist, you can get away with putting it really close because, um, you know, it's relative, your mouth is relatively small as a sound source and it's sort of, you know, an accepted sound, like we know from sort of pop music, like what that sounds like, you know, to have that. But I mean, if, if you're playing like a, a cello or a bass or, you know, a tuba or any, anything large like that, and you put the mic too close, it's almost certainly going to sound kind of weird one way or the other, because there's just too much sound energy coming out from other parts of the instrument that that mic is no longer really picking up. So um, going too, too close could also be an issue. Uh, and I know it's sort of lame to give such non-committal advice, like don't go too far, don't go too close, don't be too this, don't, but also don't do that. Um, but it's kind of true. So it's, it's good to experiment. Um, that's what it comes down to basically for everyone. Uh, just make a, a couple of test recordings. It'll be really obvious probably if you change significantly um, the, some of the variables, you know, be like, wow, that sounds terrible. I'm not going to do that again. Um, yeah, room modes, exactly. So I'll, I'll pause there again if anyone has any, any questions on that. There's, there's a lot to talk about, obviously. One other thing that's really good too is um, if you have a room that uh, has some non-parallel surfaces or if, or if there's some way you can just orient yourself to avoid having a lot of parallel surfaces, that's helpful too. Um, it's a good thing to try. Um, Luke, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about recording yourself outside and not in rooms. Like in on plein air, as it were, in nature. Yeah. That's, I think, going to be a, an extremely difficult thing for most people because um, unless it's an extremely calm day, 
the level of air motion, even if it doesn't feel like a strong breeze, a microphone diaphragm is so sensitive to that, that unless you have really good wind protection, you're going to get a ton of like low frequency rumble stuff, which is like my worst nightmare to deal with, uh, to try to clean up in a record. Well, not my worst night. It's pretty bad though. Um, so it will almost certainly not be like a flattering recording if you go, if you go outside, maybe if you have access to like a cave or an extremely dense, like forested area or something, it could be kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it basically like, if you can, if you can feel any air moving on the surface of your skin, it's going to be way too much for a microphone, unless you have a, like a, one of those huge, you know, proper windscreens. But outdoor recordings are awesome and like field recordings. I mean, it, it's super cool. It's just, unfortunately, it's very challenging without the proper equipment to, to do it. And I saw there was a question somewhere. Uh, oh, singers. Yeah. So, so to do like the sort of ISO booth thing or to like really make a super, super, super dry recording by like putting a blanket over you or doing something like that, I would not recommend that unless it like serves the piece. So I guess like if you have a piece where it's extremely like delicate, nuanced stuff, maybe sort of like extended technique stuff, like unconventional vocal, you know, you want like micro detail, maybe that would be good to just cut out everything. All you're gonna get is just those sounds. But the issue is like, if you make it too, too, too dead, it's again, gonna sound a little weird in its own way. Um, and for something like pop music, that's much more established aesthetically. And it's common that you do that. And everyone's in, has some sort of isolation. And then there's a whole, obviously, as you know, everyone knows, I'm sure like a ton of work goes into, you know, all the effects and the different reverbs and the delays and how you mix it and how you like create your own space. And that's, that's kind of cool in a way, but um, I mean, it's, it's probably not going to be like the most natural way to do recording for like the type of material most people are working on for for at least for z festival i would imagine but uh yeah if it seems to like really serve the music you know any anything is the right decision if if i mean you're trying to record the music so <laughs> um yeah same for instruments too you know like like if you're doing something that's really really delicate you know on like a bowed string instrument maybe it makes sense to put the mic you know if you're if you're never going above like mezzo piano and you're doing all kinds of weird harmonics like maybe putting the mic super close to the the strings or the bridge is actually a great idea, you know, even if that's not the like, conventional wisdom. So uh, I probably should have said that earlier. That's that's probably like a good point of departure for any of this is just, uh, you know, what seems like the, would be the best thing for the part piece. Yeah, that's a good point. Let me see, do I have? Yeah, I have some more stuff. I think we should probably move on unless anyone has any other questions on room stuff. Cool, okay. So microphone wise, um, this is another thing that is important and I, I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this either, but I'm just gonna show a couple important things. Um, Hopefully everyone is able to see that again. So um, polar patterns, I'm sure people know what those are, uh, or at least the shapes are familiar. Some of these you're unlikely to encounter like, uh, you know, shotgun, um, but they're basically the way that microphones here and many people will have microphones with a switchable selector so that you could put them in different ones of these, depending what you need. And so it's important to just, for anyone who has the option to change what their microphone is doing, I just wanted to, to touch on this because it's super important. And um, the this on the left, I made this little annotation. So you can sort of, if you haven't interpreted one of these diagrams before, you can, this is sort of how you read it. So you picture this being the front. And so omnidirectional is obviously picking everything up from all around, but for example, a cardioid, is most sensitive at the front, somewhat less sensitive at the sides, at the very back, it's almost completely uh, deadened to any sound coming from that direction. So, um, and the, the point I wanna make 
the analogy I wanted to make is that um, if this feels sort of unfamiliar and like, how do I know which is which and what's better? It's really, uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think it's really intuitive to think about polar patterns as being kind of like focal length for camera lenses. So if you imagine like this is um, a series of photos that are all taken from the same spot, but just with different progressively longer lenses. And you can see obviously how, you know, the 18 millimeter is super wide angle. And then the 300 millimeter of that barn is like dominating the frame, even though they're all from the same location. And so it's kind of the same idea with different microphone patterns, um, depending on how widely they pick up sound or how narrow you're going to sort of get that same effect of like spotlighting just, you know, what they're pointing at, for example. And typically for doing home recording stuff, um, a cardioid pattern, uh, or possibly in some cases, maybe a figure eight, depending on the room could be good. And it's, unless you have a good room, if you have the option to use something like an omnidirectional or, you know, wide cardioid or whatever, it's probably best not to do that because you're going to um, just emphasize the room. In a, in a proper recording situation, typically omnis are the first choice and then you you avoid the more directional stuff unless you need it because usually the omnidirectional mics will sound the best and the most natural, but obviously most people aren't don't have the luxury of the, like the situation that will allow for that. So definitely if your mic can be uh, set to cardioid, set it to cardioid as a rule of thumb. If you have a laptop or a phone, if basically if you have any device where if you look at, at it and there's like a little round hole that like you probably can't even see there and that's the, the microphone, that's an omnidirectional element by definition. So you need to be careful. Um, and for people that are using something like that, definitely erring on the side of coming close is better. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And a good way to know if you're not sure if your microphone looks like this, if it has any kind of like vents on the side, or if it looks like this and it has a sort of like a head basket, then it's almost certainly like 99.9% .9 likely that it is either a cardioid or maybe a wide cardioid or whatever. If they don't say, and it has that type of exposure on multiple sides to sound, you should assume that it's a directional microphone. And if it's um, if it looks like more like this, where it's like it's smooth and it's only exposed on one at one side to the sound, it's going to be an omni by by definition because the way they achieve the directional characteristic is having the sound come in from different sides. So that's a good sort of rule of thumb. Um, and there's obviously a million different kinds of mics. Everyone's using different stuff. You know, people have USB mics. People have phones, they have, um, you know, webcams, whatever, but uh, those basic factors are, are good to, to keep in mind. And, and also, um, just remember too, if it's, if it's very small, um, it's going to have a much higher level of background noise, which is unavoidable from the, just the physics of how microphones work. The larger the diaphragm, the quieter they are. There's certain reasons why you don't want a really big diaphragm sometimes, but, but it's um, definitely quieter. And they're really tiny, tiny ones, like what would be in a phone. Um, just by nature of physics, we'll have a much higher level of noise. So that means, you know, if you're recording something really quiet, you may hear a sort of a just continuously. And um, there's certain things you can do to, to remove some steady state background noise, but it's never ideal. And it's definitely better to just avoid that by getting a higher proportion of the direct sound by moving it close. So that's a really big thing for anyone that's using a small device uh, that has a small microphone element. And I saw this question about the phone. Yeah, so with the phone, with clipping and stuff, it's it's a big problem and there's really no like good answer with that stuff. And on top of everything else, most of those devices are doing some sort of processing that you can't necessarily turn off and that only makes it worse. But I guess what I would say is um, definitely try some test recordings because you might be surprised if you move the mic around just a little bit it might for whatever reason, like not clip, but still sounds pretty similar. It can be really unpredictable how they behave. You know, a few inches could make a big difference. And then also um, if you're, uh, I... like if, you, if, you're, if you're doing something percussive, like there's someone was sharing a toy piano recording. If it clips just on like the initial transient of the toy piano, 
it might not sound great, but that's not the end of the world, especially if it's something that's primarily like a noise, you know, broadband noise pulse. Um, I mean, obviously that wouldn't be ideal if you're doing a recording, but like for the purposes of getting the best we all can out of this situation, that's not the end of the world. But um, like I, so to put that another way, I would, as an engineer, I would rather get a recording of a toy piano that's as clean as possible from a phone where there isn't a ton of background noise. It sounds pretty good. And then on all of just the very highest peaks, it clips a little bit. I can work with that. But if it's clipping, like whenever it gets loud or something, obviously that's, that's a huge problem. And that those kind of, longer duration distortions are really hard to to get around so definitely yeah avoid that if at all possible um also if anyone is doing something with a a phone or another device that maybe doesn't have like the best microphone and they're doing uh, anything that produces wind especially vocal but i don't know maybe even if like i don't know if anyone here is playing like a a wind instrument where they might want to have it really close. Um, you could theoretically uh, maybe put like a little bit of a thin cloth as a sort of makeshift pop filter to keep that wind from doing too much damage. Um, that may or may not be a problem for for some people, but yeah, phones are phones are tough. Uh, is it better to record closer to built-in computer? No, it's yeah. So built-in for all intents and purposes a built-in computer mic is a phone mic. Like it's the same basic, uh, and the same goes for a web, like a phone, uh, a webcam, a laptop, a tablet, any of those consumer electronic devices are gonna have like a really small, somewhat noisy microphone that you should probably be as close as possible to without causing distortion and problems to get a, a clean recording. That's like a good rule of thumb. And then, and then people who have like a USB microphone or um, using like a, like a regular, you know, studio style microphone with an interface, or if you have like a, a zoom, like a portable recorder, something that has like more of like a mid range sort of tier of microphone that can be much more, um, sensitive and you're probably better off coming away a little bit. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to make that compromise. And then at that point, you're probably thinking more about like the room and, and stuff like that, you know? So I don't know if anyone has any other questions about that. I can imagine there's probably a lot of microphone stuff. I didn't want to, I won't just let people, you know, if anyone has any thoughts, questions, there's a lot to talk about there. So. Um, when looking to buy a microphone, that's not crazy expensive. Like what should you be looking for? Maybe depending on your instrument. I guess um, for People who, if you, so it depends on the application, I would say, because if you're trying to do like a home recording for something like this, you really only need one mic. It's unlikely you'd be doing a stereo recording of yourself for most things, even if that's like hypothetically better, because why would you make a stereo recording in a small room that's not an idea? So if you want to like get the best out of this type of environment, making a recording, I would say get um, a something like an audio technica or sure you know there's a bunch of like they're not cheap but they're not super super expensive a large diaphragm uh not large diaphragm because they're large diaphragm but they're the ones that are switchable are large diaphragm in that price range and the flexibility of being able to switch the pattern is uh really valuable for home recording so that and they're going to be pretty quiet mics if uh, you know, you won't have to worry about it. Like it's a night and day difference if you have a mic like that compared to trying to use a, a phone or something. So that's what I would recommend. I, mo I don't know off the top of my head, most of them are in, you know, the like three, four hundred dollar price range. You can get stuff, especially if you buy something used. Um, there's a bunch of different manufacturers, but somewhere in that range, it'll probably be decent. Um, you can, you know, if it's like a, you know, normal manufacturer, like one of the better manufacturers. But the thing to remember with that is obviously for a lot of people, I'm really sympathetic that the, the convenience of like a USB microphone, cause you just plug that into your computer or whatever. If you buy one of like one of these switchable pattern, like a Audio Technica or whatever, Mike, um, you're gonna need to either use something like a Zoom recorder that has an XLR input or an audio interface with your computer. So if you already have that, great. And then it's not an issue. But if you don't have that type of equipment already, you just have your, you know, tablet or your computer, 
um, it's probably going to be a much bigger investment to get everything you would need to do that kind of recording, which is still like totally maybe worthwhile. Like I would never say that's a waste, but it's definitely a much bigger investment to get all the stuff you would need to use that type of microphone in that type of situation. So for some people, I could also imagine that just getting a USB microphone could be great. There are some decent ones. They're not great, but they're pretty good. Um, and, uh, and, and many of them have uh, switchable patterns as well. So that, that could be definitely worth looking into. Yeah, for home recording, excuse me. I would say that the good thing also about getting like a you know proper microphone is if you end up wanting to use it later, like I know a couple musicians here who, who even like they pick one out that like, you know, I'm a flute player. I tried a bunch of mics. This is the one I really like. I liked it so much. Like I bought it. It's mine. Like I don't do that many recordings myself, but when I go to a session, like I give it to the recording engineer, like can you use this. It's my favorite mic. You know, it can be worthwhile to longer term to have that. And then it can be useful in many situations Whereas, like a USB mic, you know, it's good for recording at home, but I, I would never want to like record a concert with a USB mic. Uh, so it's not, it's not really as like flexible, I guess, long term. Um, yeah. Any other? Yeah. There's a, there's a question about your uh, microphone inventory, but perhaps maybe that's oh, for um, the, uh, yeah. the end of the I talk mean, or something like that. Yeah, it's gonna get, it's gonna get pretty nerdy pretty quick. Oh, actually there's one thing I did though, that was, I, I don't know if this is like too sort of cute and, and pathetic for people, but I, I wanted to get away from having so many slides. I, and it sucks like when both your parents are academics, you know, and you're just like steeped in this from childhood, it's like, I was really glad that you and Shoshana gave me some uh, good advice on that. But so I cut these out. So this is a little cardioid, little cardioid pattern. Um, I just thought I just thought it would be cool, to, like with an actual microphone, just to make this point with with physical microphones instead of like slides and trying to be too nerdy about it. So, like if you if this is how your microphone is picking up the sound, like you need to you know remember that like you know it's a little switch. But like maybe you know it's you you have to you have to picture this sort of like radiating out in this shape you know in three dimensions from this surface. It's not like you see these two dimensional representations on a little circle, but like it's it's sort of like a bubble that comes out of this whole area in three dimensions. And so uh, unfortunately, that's kind of hard to visualize from the the way that it's typically represented graphically. But then like, especially for something like a figure of eight, you know, you can see like this is shown on the mic. They show you the, you know, so that means that, you know, if you have the actual thing, you know, that's that's how it hears. So from the sides, it's almost no pickup at all. And then in these two directions, it's maximum sensitivity. Uh, it, and in three dimensions, that would be like two sort of bubbles and then this area where there's nothing. So that's just really good to, to keep in mind and think, think three-dimensionally, I guess, whenever possible about that stuff. Um, and as just on figure eight really quick. So people very, very rarely use figure eight. They don't really know what it's for. Why would I do it? It's, it's like confusing, it's weird. There's like this polarity thing, like one lobe is positive and like, and there's mid side recording. Like, I guess that's cool, but it's so nerdy. Why would you do that? But just having a figure of eight mic can be super useful for something like home recording. And the reason why is if your microphone is switchable and you have that, many of them will have that option. The reason is um, it picks up the least reflected sound of any pattern in, in, the, in, the, in the whole like sort of vertical plane. So like a cardioid doesn't pick up anything from the back, but if you're in a room like this on the sides and if it's facing this way, in the sides of that microphone, it'll still pick up ceiling reflections. It'll still pick up floor reflections. If you're using a figure of eight, which would be, um, you know, oriented like this in the room, and your instrument is here, this lobe will pick up the direct sound of the instrument. This lobe is a problem, but you could put like a blanket or something around the back to try to reduce the pickup. And meanwhile, you have the whole axis here of the floor, the walls, the ceiling in a total dead spot of that mic. So even though the way it hears is like a little bit unintuitive, it can actually be one of the best for like a small room 
if you just take a little time. So um, I just want to mention that for people that have that, that option. Yeah. Microphones. Uh, okay. Yeah. Should is is there any other pressing stuff on that? Does anyone have any? Oh, modular octave. Yeah. So 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 SDC. If anyone sees that in the chat, um, so that means small diaphragm condenser. So like for example, like this is a large diaphragm condenser. This is a small diaphragm condenser. So the membrane in this is about an inch wide. The membrane in this is like, you know, 15 or 16 millimeters wide, whatever that works out to in inches. And um, the advantage of the smaller diaphragm mics is that they usually sound better. They're more accurate. They respond more sensitively to the pressure variation, um, but they have higher noise and it's harder to design them to have switchable patterns. So you rarely find one that's switchable. So that's why that one that you mentioned, Corey, in the chat, the Octava, they're modular, So, which this is as well. So like you can unscrew this from the body. And so like this is the this is an omnidirectional capsule, but like you can buy others that have a different pickup pattern and then screw them onto the body. So it's, it's almost like with camera lenses, that, that same analogy. Um, and the Octava ones, those are, those are quite good. Like I, I don't own them. I've heard many recordings with them. They're, they're pretty respectable. You know, they sound pretty good. Those are good, but there's a lot of other things out there that may be equally good. Um, those I think have like a ton of sort of like name recognition in like the home recording worlds because they're like a good budget option. So people always talk about them, but just so so anyone who's watching this is aware, there's lots of other good options that are comparable. So like one that I, I do have, which is kind of same idea. This is a Sure microphone. It's not super expensive. Um, these are a few hundred dollars. And uh, this is, Omni, it's a small diaphragm condenser again, but it has this sort of collar that can rotate, um, which is, this is actually a copy of a design of a much more expensive German microphone. And uh, in this, you probably can't see, but there's, so that's the Omni mode. And then if you rotate this, it becomes cardioid. And the way that that works is a little, um, you can't see, I'm sure in the webcam, but a little like collar goes up inside of here and blocks off these vents. And then that changes it from being an Omni or a, a cardioid. And so that's really good too. And it's convenient to have it in the same body and they sound perfectly good. I mean, they're not like my best microphones, but you know, you could, you could get a really good recording with them. You could use them on anything, you know? Um, so those are worth looking into. There's a bunch of things sort of in that price range that, that do the same kind of thing. So I would definitely recommend doing some, some research. There's a ton of stuff out there. Um, I would stay away from any kind of small diaphragm microphone that's very cheap, like Rode uh, makes some mics that are actually really pretty respectable, but then some like really budget mics that look kind of good. And like, you can see a million like nice recordings on someone's website with like these or how great they sound with like the, you know, Brisbane Symphony Orchestra or whatever. But like, there's no way to get around the fact that like those smaller mics, it's a lot harder to like make them quiet, make them really sound good. And like the really expensive ones, are kind of justified for why they're really expensive. So if you get, if you're gonna try to not spend too much, I would say it's probably gonna sound better to, if you get one of those, um, you know, like Sure or Audio-Technica or like switchable larger diaphragm microphones, they're easier to manufacture and it, it's probably gonna be a better sound as a general rule of thumb. And if you wanna get like the small diaphragm condensers, that's probably what I would recommend if you wanted to make like the best sounding recordings, but they're, they're gonna probably cost a bit more. For good ones, yeah. Oh, I should also mention, um, I'm like on my email all the time. So if anyone like has questions that come up later or whatever, you know, feel free to email me. I think about this stuff all the time. I'm happy to give a little, you know, advice if I can or whatever. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll finish up then. I have the... Um, the last little segment was um, talking about different different recommendations for home stuff. We already covered some of this, but there's just a few other points I wanted to make. So um, the, the equipment is out of a lot of people's control right now. Um, so just as to reiterate, the position in the room, the treatment of the room, if you can you know, adjust the acoustics um, physically, uh, 
are by and and the placement of the microphone are, are by far the biggest um, biggest things within your control. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I'll, I'll just share this. You can all see this. It's more logical than me. Just so this is kind of a little list, uh, not you know complete necessarily by any means, but these are sort of the biggest things that came to my mind um, that would be helpful for people. And one one on here, which I didn't even touch on yet, but which is super 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 important, is when you make these recordings, the higher quality. Uh, the highest quality they can be, uh, the better. So a lot of things like voice memos and other little apps are, are like maybe convenient, but they will almost certainly um, not record in the highest possible quality. And especially if you're dealing with a smartphone or a webcam mic, that's not the best mic in the world to begin with. Um, if, it, if you record it as an MP3, for example, um, that makes it extremely difficult to do like proper post-production work or you know you can change the level but like once you start trying to eq or or do noise reduction on an mp3 it's very tough and the best analogy i think because people talk about this sometimes and it's like well who cares 16 bit mp3 24 you know who cares the best way to i think um visualize that is to remember that it's, it's a compressed format so it's basically like a jpeg an mp3 is like a jpeg and a wave is like a huge high resolution like DSLR digital image or like a photo print, you know, and you can zoom into it or, you know, however you want to make analogies, but you can do a lot more with the higher resolution file. And just like with a JPEG, if you get like a really crappy JPEG and you want to like make it big and it's like, oh, wow, that looks incredibly pixelated and awful. That's sort of the same thing that will happen with, with MP3s in uh, Sonic realm. So that's the reason why I say that. And then um, the recording levels too, um, we didn't really, touch on that too much but that's very important and um it's not like a crazy rocket science thing it's just you know you'll have some kind of meter to see what the levels are and you definitely don't want them to be too high because you don't want to clip but you also don't want them to be too low because then there will be noise that you don't want so a good rule of thumb if you're able to record especially in 24-bit um, would be to have your peaks be no higher than like at minus six, uh, even like minus 10, minus 12 is fine. But if, if, if the majority of what you're recording is below like 16 or 20, 24 dB, um, it's probably gonna have more noise than, than, than needed. So there's sort of a sweet spot between like, between like, I know it's confusing that also the way it's minus, like I'm sure some of you are aware how that scale works. It's, it's kind of unfortunate, but um, zero, zero is clipping and everything else is negative. There's no positive element to that um, scale, but, but somewhere between like maybe minus 24 and minus six would be a good rule of thumb to try to get most of what you're doing within that, that range. Um, and then uh, everyone's life will be much happier. That's important. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there with like formal stuff. And then if anyone wants to talk more, I'm happy to, if anyone has more questions and stuff, but, uh, it's a lot already. So, um, yeah, thank you, Peter and Shoshana for, for having me and, uh, definitely uh, I'll put my email down in the chat and anyone should feel free to, um, reach out. Email. I'm on. I'm on the Z Festival Slack too. Uh, if you know if questions come up later, too, feel free to get in touch. I have a question. Um, I was just wondering, as far as um, so, as far as like optimizing um, the recording for something like a live, um, like a live Zoom or something like that, um, where you nobody's going to be editing the sound so you don't really want it completely dead uh so you may want to get some of that room sound um that's a know. really valid point 
for sure. And um, yeah, I should have maybe mentioned more explicitly that like a lot of what I was talking about today is sort of with like Z Festival in mind and the sort of paradigm we have here for working. But um, yeah, if you, if you're doing, and th this is another like personal taste thing for me, but uh, ultimately a, like a room like this is always gonna be audible in the recording. There's no way to make it not sound like I'm in this room. And at the end of the day, I would rather hear a recording that has decent mic placement, but I can hear it's in a small room than a recording that's like artificially bizarrely deadened with like someone with like, you know, singing into like a, you know, down jacket inside of a, you know, tent of blankets and stuff. Um, so I think as long as you, like if you're doing something like that where there isn't necessarily any post-production, then it's maybe even more important to do some test recordings, some, you know, mic placement stuff, you know, definitely try to, um, get that right but but you know some some room sound just makes it sound honest like that's where it is you know <laughs> um there's nothing wrong with that per se uh yeah actually not to get too too nerdy with the microphone array stuff but that's kind of uh yeah an element of that sorry did that answer your question though i don't mean to to um um, yeah, I guess, uh, do, would you have any specific advice? Say that it's like something like a Zoom live thing where you're gonna be do, recording through your computer, which is also gonna be capturing the visuals and yeah. not really, you don't have a lot of options as far as sure. external mics go. So, so if you're using Zoom, like I would definitely make a recording with Zoom, like even before you're streaming, just make like a test recording uh, to see how it sounds and try some different placements. Uh, and anyone else who's you know participating, if they if they can, sh ideally should should do that and see see what works best. Um, and that would be like a good sort of preliminary step to doing the actual the actual stream. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Especially if you're using the built-in mics and stuff. I mean, the really the only variable you have is the position to to adjust the the sound like if you're not going to do post either you know it's just it is what it is so it's really the only thing is where where are you uh, positioning yourself also with zoom um for i'm sure a lot of you guys you probably all know this already but there's a ton of stuff that zoom does under the hood that uh is really really not what you want for music uh and you can turn that off in the advanced audio preferences and you definitely should um if you're going to use it for something like that, you have to dig around, but you can turn off the acoustic echo cancellation. You can turn off the um, background noise suppression. You, it's doing so much stuff to the audio to try to make like, because it's for this, you know, I mean, but obviously that's totally not the situation when you're doing a music performance. So definitely turn that off. Yeah. Um, there's another question from YouTube that I missed uh, during the buying a microphone mm -hmm. portion. Um, and it's about uh, buying dynamic versus condenser or if anyone oh, yeah. would have use for a ribbon. That's an old question. Well, ribbon microphones nowadays, just in relatively recent years, there's a lot uh, coming out which are so-called active ribbon mics. So the conventional wisdom for a long time was that you really can't get a ribbon uh, unless you have a really nice proper preamp because they need like a ton of gain because they're not sensitive microphones at all. But that's sort of no longer the case with these like active ribbons. Um, so a ribbon mic could be good depending on what instrument you play and what your situation is. It's not maybe the most versatile mic in the world, um, but it's really good at certain things. Like most um, maybe not anymore, but most uh, of the classic recordings of plucked string instruments and of um, bowed like string quartet from anywhere from like the 30s up until the 60s or 70s, most of the, you know, great ones were made with ribbon mics, or at least a, a, a large number of them. They have a very smooth sound for instruments that have a lot of like complex harmonics and sharp transients and stuff, but they're, I don't know if I would recommend that for, for someone. Um, for dynamics, they have some similar characteristics because it's not as sensitive, 
So on the one hand, it's like, well, a condenser is super sensitive, but sometimes you don't want it super sensitive. And like, if you're gonna have it near your mouth, you don't wanna get all the clicky mouth sounds or, you know, again, like a plucked string instrument, it can be kind of good to smooth out stuff a little bit. Um, but most dynamic mics, the issue is because they're not very sensitive, they're totally unsuitable for doing like distant miking. So if you're gonna do stuff at home, if you're gonna mic close, if maybe you're you're concerned about like, I don't need 100% detail, I just want like a sort of smooth, like nice close sound, a dynamic mic could be, could be really good and they're not usually terribly expensive. But um, you know, if it's if it's more than a few couple feet away from the instrument, it's not gonna sound very good compared to a condenser. So it's partly, I guess, what your situation is, and also like how flexible you would want it to be in the future, maybe for other for other stuff. Because a condenser mic, they have their own problems too. There's no you know perfect mic, but a condenser mic by far is the most versatile type of microphone to have. Um, that's the sort of easiest way of putting it, maybe. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Um, I'm curious if anybody else here has any questions on what Luke has covered. Um, if not, I feel like I kind of want to like take the lid off and just like let you be nerdy and geeky about microphone arrays and go through your inventory and I don't know whatever Yikes. topics you feel um, <clears throat> might be uh, exciting for perhaps the, the 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 more advanced people in this zoom call right now <clears throat> yeah I guess we can give it a, a second for any other uh, questions I'm just going to get another glass of water really quick uh, but I'll be back in about one minute Does anyone encourage him to be really nerdy? Yay. Because <laughs> it's great. Yay. He's like worried that people won't be interested, but it's really fun. Mm. Does anybody else have questions about stuff you covered? I don't want to push over that if there are questions. I was actually also going to ask the ribbon microphone question, but I guess somebody beat me to it. Yeah, that was that's a, that's Amelia on the YouTube chat. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, any any lingering thoughts? Yeah, I guess the um, phone stuff that you've mentioned. I've had a fun time doing like a bunch of audio cleanup with isotope because mm -hmm. uh, some people are i think one or two people are not doing it with phone mics but most people are doing it with phone mics so. mm -hmm. fun times yeah it's it's a challenge in the, the best of times with that but um but you can do a certain amount definitely What, one thing actually that's that's really good just to mention about that is um, for anyone who's doing a recording with a phone and they anticipate that there might be some pretty serious background noise, um, the way that programs like Isotope work, uh, it, it's it's very helpful to have a good chunk of just the background noise to train the algorithms on before you do the removal step. So like if you can make a recording with like a full 20 seconds or so of just whatever the steady state noise is, that's great. Cause um, when you have to piece it together from smaller segments, uh, it's not as accurate and it can sometimes have more artifacts. So that's a good thing for people to do. I guess um, this brings up another thing, which is have you used something like audio sculpt or spear to try to get like really specific things? I just use RX for that because you can, I mean, with the um, spectrograph view and the tool, like instead of um, there, you know, so you probably know there's the tools that will do like a, either like a frequency domain slice for the whole thing or a vertical 
time domain slice, but I mean, you can also like in Photoshop style, you know, do like a little lasso and like draw over a specific sound event that you want to remove. So that's usually what I do. Um, and sometimes uh, it's kind of a weird, it's probably probably flies in the face of what Isotope would recommend, but um, for certain things that are really hard to remove, like um, if you have a, like I had a, a really tragic uh, thing happen when I was doing a recording uh, a couple of years ago with a forte piano, which had been um, kept in really good shape and then was moved into a room without like any proper attention to humidity. And the um, soundboard actually cracked during the recording. And um, the you know, instrument is under like so much tension, even a forte piano, let alone a piano. The, it, I mean, it sounded like a gunshot. I was terrified. I, the first thing I thought, because I had my headphones on too, and the first thing I thought was like my mic stand had been like knocked over or something, and it was it was crazy. Um, but so like to to try to take that out of the recording, um, you know, the easiest thing. I mean, needless to say, that jeopardized that particular take. But um, to uh, take something like that out of a recording, a lot of times it's easier to just copy and paste a region of background noise. You know, you don't always have to like algorithmically remove noise with an algorithm uh, with a with a um, noise reduction setting. You can just like circle the event, draw it out, and then like copy a you know chunk of silence that's from the same frequency band uh, and put it on top. You know, in some cases, it's a cleaner way. Yeah, I've done stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um like once the phone went off yeah and i was like how do i get this out and i just kind of circled the frequencies yeah in that range and and there's a good tool i think if you use the like magic wand tool uh, at least in the newer versions of rx they, they it does a thing now where it can um it can try to uh separate, analyze and separate which partials above a fundamental belong to that same fundamental. So like if you have mm -hmm. a bunch of other information going on and it's pretty harmonically dense, but then there's like, you know, like a percussionist hits like a, a bell or something at the wrong spot, you could theoretically like isolate the fundamental and then it, it'll try to identify which partials go with that fundamental and lower those all sort of surgically, but without messing up the stuff in the middle but honestly like all that stuff is really cool i use rx all the time way more than i would like to use rx it is amazing but it's super super frustrating to have that like consciousness in people that you can do that stuff because a lot of times people assume that like anything can can be fixed or that it's like a good good workflow to like have a recording yeah. that's full of uh issues that you have to like Mm. you know clean up that way uh yeah yeah uh, it, well so microphones that, uh, that array well. stuff yeah um well so the basic idea this is like an ongoing i have one or two photos of this, maybe that would be most helpful if I just show a couple things really quick. So this was a really weird and failed, well, not failed, I learned a lot. Um, I was both trying out a technique that I've been working on and trying to put it as close to being on the floor as possible without touching the floor to do it as like a sort of pseudo boundary mic setup. Um, and then the mics on the outside are just omni to provide a spaced omni reference to compare to this more unconventional thing I was trying. And it sounded extremely weird, um, but it was very interesting to try. And uh, there's a lot of good reasons why it was probably a dumb idea, but I have a lot of time on my hands right now in the evenings. And I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna do it. So that's kind of a example of, and then more, conventionally um, back when I, this is at Harvard where I work and when I had uh, time, I was able to do some really nice proper recordings with their very beautiful piano. So that's more seriously what I've been, you know, up to when I can. 
And uh, so up here on this stand, there's several different setups all being recorded simultaneously. And so that's been like a key part of what I'm doing because uh, you know it's fine to just set up a bunch of mics and make recordings, but um, you know if you're not comparing your test configuration to something that you kind of know how it sounds, it's not really that helpful. So a key part of this has been doing these kind of like uh, you know control group experiments where there's something that's a very standard setup and something that's less standard set up and then and then comparing them. So I've done like about 35 of them now. And I'm I'm getting close to some things I really like, uh, which has been fun. And um yeah the the basic the basic concept behind what I've been working on is the fact that uh and I guess this may be interesting for some people. So it's very, very typical that you use like spaced omnidirectional microphones. <coughs> I'm sure you guys have seen this all the time, you know, people will have like two mics that are like this far apart or even farther apart. That's one of the most common ways that acoustic music is recorded. Um, but the issue with that is, you know, so your om omnidirectional mics have no, I mean, they do have some directionality at high frequencies to be technical, but the, for all intents and purposes, like if you orient them like this, it's not gonna make a big difference. Uh, but by, making them horizontally spaced, the time difference in the two mics is what creates the stereophony. So that's cool. Like our ears are very sensitive to phase differences and, and it's like a totally valid way to do stereo. But the issue is like the farther you start moving them apart, uh, it gets to be a little bit blurred and unnatural, like in terms of being able to hear where stuff is. Some people are really sensitive to that. Other people don't really care about it. Um, so like the disadvantage with that kind of spaced omni technique is that uh, the ability to, to precisely orient what you're listening to is, is not as good. Um, and on the other hand, the, another technique you see a lot is something like XY where people do this. Um, this is actually a figure eight that I grabbed. So I apologize. This is not, this is, but I'll do it this way. So you see like this a lot and that's using directional mics and that will pick up, you know, this one will pick up from this way, this one will pick up from that way. And then that gives you your left and right. And that's very, uh, makes it very clear where stuff is coming from. But the disadvantage is now they're in the exact same spot. There's no phase difference. So here it was all phase here. There's no phase difference. That's good if you want to like mix down to mono but if you're trying to make like a nice stereo recording, at least for my taste, this is an extremely unsatisfying sound and I, I never ever use it. Uh, you see that a lot in like little zoom recorders cause it's just easy to manufacture something where there's just two little mics that just go like that, but it's not a desirable sound per se. So the other, the other thing that you see a lot like in concert halls or places where they have like a hanging mic setup is um, like a near coincident setup. And most of those were developed by like broadcasters in the 60s and 70s and they'll do directional microphones but instead of putting them on top of each other they'll do it like this way and then the idea there is that they're directional so they're listening in that way but then you also do get a certain amount of time difference between them so that's another kind of compromise and those also are are very common that's a very common way of setting up mics i've used those techniques there's a bunch of them you know many times um, but I've also never been like hundred percent crazy about how those sound either, uh, for a bunch of reasons. And one of them, which is pretty significant is that most microphones sound best on axis. They're engineered to give the most natural sound to what is arriving straight on. And if you do this type of a technique, you need really, really good microphones to make the best possible recording with that type of technique, because the majority of the direct sound is not coming on access to the microphone. So if they're, if they're high quality microphones, it's not a huge deal, but it's still not ideal. Ideally you would want them facing directly. And like, that's how it is with spaced omnis, for example. So the whole thing I've been working on with this research is um, I wanted to, I like the sound of spaced omnis the best or spaced microphones the best, but I don't, I wanted more precision and not so like amorphous a sound. Uh, 
and so I was reading a lot about psychoacoustics and other stuff um, and I got really interested in the idea of like the interaural distance because um, you know if you think about it the distance between your ears is fixed for every person and without you know thinking about it like your brain has already been trained to interpret that specific time difference over many years so and in most people it's not that different between person to person i mean it's, it's around you know 20 centimeters or so and so if you put two mics at that distance the time differences between the two mics by definition are going to replicate what approximately what you're used to already with your ears so that was sort of like my point of departure for doing these experiments is only using that spacing and that was really cool and it was kind of um eye-opening to start doing that but then the disadvantage is like let's say you're using omnis and they're this far apart they they're not very directional at all so this is a very mono heavy signal and if you're trying to record you know like an orchestra or something i mean it would sound terrible like there's there's very little ability to hear the whole three dimensional you know sound and localize the sounds because there's just not enough difference in level between the two mics they're almost picking up the same thing it's just this little distance so i started to do a lot of experiments using um figure eight mics in different ways and for people who know about ms recording i mean the idea with using figure eights is that if you point the uh to refresh people's memory with the pickup pattern you know if you if you point the dead part with so like it picks up from the sides if you point it like that at the sound then it's only picking up the diffuse sound from the sides it's not picking up hardly any direct sound so if you combine that with something like an omnidirectional microphone then you can get much more interesting ability to have directional uh, pickup and so like in MS recording that's what they do they piggyback them like this a lot of you guys have probably seen that so one it doesn't have to be an omni two this is typically more often like a cardioid or, or wide cardioid for MS but so that that one picks up the direct sound this one picks up only the diffuse sound and then by doing also a little bit of fancy matrixing stuff you derive a left and a right and then you have independent control over the direct sound and the diffuse sound which is really cool to have that option and so that was sort of my approach. So I basically just done a million different ways of combining not just Omnis, but other mics with figure eight mics where they're on top of each other, where there's like two figure eights with a mic in between them and they're sort of sharing it, um, like all different combinations just to see what works best. Cause I, I'm not aware of a lot of research on this and it's so empirical anyway. So I just um, try to do my own kind of little studies on it, but it, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting and um, I'm getting close to a couple that I think are really promising where I've compared them to ORTF, I've compared them to MS, I've compared them to spaced omnis and I like the ones that I'm experimenting with more than all of those, at least for my taste. So so it's pretty, it's pretty cool stuff uh, if that's your cup of tea, I suppose. But I should probably not talk more about that. Now I think that's like more than enough about how that so, I mean, unless like, does anyone honestly want to hear more about that? I mean, one one thing that's really cool about figure eights, I guess, is so like people usually use them in like an MS. You have to like reverse the phase on one side, like you you because this is a single channel, so it's kind of confusing because like you know this this gives you one channel, but if the sound comes from this way, it produces a positive or whatever, one polarity of voltage. I don't know which is which technically, but then and if it comes from the other side, you get the opposite polarity of voltage because it's one membrane that's going back and forth like this. But in order to give you like a left and a right, you have to take this one channel and duplicate it into two channels and then pan them like hard left and hard right and then flip the phase on one of them. Uh, and then you recombine it. So it's like this whole process. But the thing that I started to kind of get into with the um, using figure eights so much is actually like there's a lot you don't need, like that's not the only thing to do with figure eights. It's really interesting. So like, um, you know, if you have a pair, like two 
of these. For example, like here. This is one of the ones I'm experimenting with. So if you have two of these like this, and then the omnis are close together and the figure eights are looking in opposite directions, you can just sum them with the omnis. You don't need to necessarily do like a big MS like thing. It's not even necessarily a good sound. And then and then what's cool is like if you know if this is the one half of that of that array with four mics, then the omni is picking up everything and with an emphasis on the direct sound. And then when something comes from this side, it's going to be like let's say a positive polarity. And if it comes from this side, it's going to be let's say a negative polarity. So then when they're just summed in the mix, anything that came from this side will sum constructively with the omni and emphasize pick up in that direction. Anything that came from this side, it'll be negative polarity and it will reduce the sensitivity to that direction. And so then if you have, like I was saying, a pair of them, you get a, a left and a right directionality, like just by summing the, the figure eights with the omnis. Or, or whatever you choose, not, not omnis necessarily, but you know, so that it's kind of an interesting thing. I never, I had never really thought about them that way before, uh, but it's really useful. And also I've been experimenting with, um, you know, it's very typical that people will orient them sideways. So like they don't pick up the direct sound, you want them to pick up the diffuse sound on the sides, but orienting them vertically is really interesting too. Um, and that's, there's no reason why that's not a potentially good idea or, doing two figure eights where now instead of piggybacking the omnis, you're piggybacking the figure eights. And then one of them is listening this way and the other is listening up and down. And now you have even more three-dimensional control over the um, diffuse sound, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, and a lot of it sounds terrible really terrible and then and then what's even well not a lot a small amount of it sounds really terrible but what's really frustrating is that a lot of it is like that's just like eh. and there's like so many variations of like eh. um so it's really rewarding when like a couple of them are like oh that's really good like that's that's promising i'm gonna keep doing that um so that's been sort of the trajectory but yeah it's getting there Cool. Um, well, thanks so much for that, Luke. I think we're going to um, take down the live stream now and we can, um, I don't know, maybe take a, a short little bathroom break or something and, and then come back and field some more questions. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. This was wonderful, uh, super helpful My pleasure. Um, for especially people getting their feet wet with technology and then also people who want to geek out and figure out different microarrays. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Luke. Uh, we're going to just give it a couple seconds. It needs to breathe the stream before we cut it.